Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, the right to vote on the right to die. Voluntary euthanasia back on the political agenda. When is a promise not a promise? Julia Gillard says she may have to backtrack on her election pledges. And could the burqa be liberating to women? Our panel tonight, Jonathan Green, editor of The Drum Online, writer and social commentator Jane Carr, and Tom Switzer, editor of The Spectator magazine. Well, first to that breaking news that you would have just heard, uh, that Rob Oakeshott has said that he won't take on the position of Speaker. In a statement, he said that uh, concerns have been raised, constitutional, practical and political, and a combination of all three regarding the agreement for a better parliament and in light of this confusion about the honouring honouring of the agreement I would be reluctant to accept any nomination for speaker so that's a statement that just come out from Rob Oakeshott. Tom Switzer is it the right move for him not to? I think it is the right move uh, the coalition especially Christopher Pine had made it quite clear in the course of the last few days that there was no deal that would be welched on uh, and uh, it makes sense for him as an independent to make sure that his vote is casted uh, he's one of uh, uh, three independents now who, who will have that right and uh, Harry Jenkins has been a very good uh, Speaker of the House. I think it's fair to say both sides of politics think he's been very fair and uh, he'll, he'll stay in that role for the next Jane, three years. what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with Tom. I think uh, it, it seemed a bit messy to have him, who was one of these people holding the balance of power, suddenly being taken out of the debate or doing both. And that didn't make any sense to me. So this seems sensible. I, I wish they'd made their mind up a bit sooner, though. Seems to be dragging on. Mm. Jonathan, do you, do you think we'll now see Harry Jenkins as his speaker, or could it be uh, a well, liberal? Philip Ruddock, maybe, has, has been mooted, um, the, the, the grandfather of the House. I mean, I think for Oakeshott, this is, this is a good thing. This, um, I, I couldn't understand, in fact, his enthusiasm for this. This is, you know, his agenda is important. I think it's something he needs to prosecute um, on the floor of the House as an independent with a vote. The other independents have made it clear uh, up until now that they're not interested in being speaker or being ministers. Is there any damage to Rob Oakeshott even being involved in these discussions? Well, the, I mean, I guess the, the sneaky subtext about this is it, it goes to his motivation here. And, and if people were wondering about this sort of uh, uh, limelight seeking nature of the uh, <laughs> the independence oh, campaign that maybe what Oakeshott did in, in, in going for this job played into that perception. But he wouldn't be on his own there, that Tom. What if he was a limelight seeker in the federal parliament? Well, I think he's just looking after his own uh, security because if he uh, doesn't have the right to vote in those uh, delicate situations, then his constituents would constituents would be, would be wondering, why do we vote for you in the first place? Mm. But I think there's an element of... I get an impression of naivety about it. A sort of eager beaver, mm. you know, oh, I could do that, oh, I could do that. <laughs> he you does know, play on that. <laughs> there's this sort of innocent schoolboy <laughs> yeah. thing about Rob Oakeshott, uh, which is kind of endearing and kind of worrying all at the same time. Well, let's move on to the other big political issue of the day, and it's an old debate with new momentum. The Greens are looking to restore the power of territory governments to debate issues like euthanasia. Euthanasia advocate Dr Philip Nitschke has welcomed this move. We've seen 15 years when Australia was relegated back into the dark ages after the passage of the Kevin Andrews Act, which took away from Territorians the same rights that other Australians have had, and that is to make legislation on this issue. Now, uh, to have the Bob Brown bill brought forward and to have Territorians given that same right back again, I'm sure we're going to see legislation come in in Australia, either in a state or a territory in the near future. But the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, questioned the importance of such a bill. I'm not denying... Uh the concerns that people have in this area, but I think that we need a parliament which focuses on bread and butter concerns. And uh, the fact that there's a minority government uh, does not excuse uh, the government from focusing on the uh, bread and butter concerns of the Australian people. Uh, the fact that they don't have a majority is no excuse not to get on with delivering the commitments that they made to the people uh, prior to the election. Jonathan, uh, a bread and butter issue, uh, the issue of voluntary euthanasia bread or not? Bread and butter like life and death. I think there's, this, I think, points out the disconnection between the political agenda and the, the agenda that's close to many people's hearts. And I think there are a lot of uh, items on the political table that people feel some distance from and a lot of items in, in people's you know, personal experience and personal set of issues that just don't get addressed in the, in the political context. And I think this is a real example of that and there's you know the polling demonstrates that there is there's considerable 
Uh, not necessarily support for the concept, but support for the idea of a public discussion. And it's, it's good that the territories will get that sort of democratic access, at least. Tom, you think there's room for these kind of debates in the Parliament? Well, it's not a pressing issue. I'm not surprisingly with Tony Abbott on this. I mean, uh, several years ago, David Maher wrote a very good essay. Uh, well, I didn't think it was good, but it was a very well-read essay, <laughs> a quarterly <laughs> essay on this very issue about the Howard government being democratically uh, thwarting the, uh, you know, the will of the people. Uh, on the issue of, of this uh, euthanasia back in 1995, 1996. But it wasn't really overturning it. It was a conscience vote, and neither the Coalition nor the Labor Party had a set position on it. I think um, this is not a, a bread and, this is not a, a bread and butter issue. It's, in so many respects, an elite-driven issue. It's a bit like the Republic. I don't think that the Republic is a, is a mainstream issue, and nor do I think that this is a mainstream issue, actually. And I, I think that if you look at examples such as in Holland, where you've essentially had the legalisation of mm. uh, euthanasia for 15, maybe 20 years now, it's, it's been a very slippery slope. You've had hundreds of people who aren't terminally ill who actually do die. Uh, and this is a great risky place in the hands of a lot of uh, physicians. OK, we'll get on to those issues uh, in a little while. But, Jane, what do you think about this issue being brought up? I mean... And, and I think it's... It I'm, uh, I'm totally with Jonathan on this. I think people who are not sick, not suffering and not dying say it isn't a pressing issue. But I think if you are in distress or fearing being in distress, then it is the most pressing issue possible. And I just feel strongly that we lack compassion when we talk about this subject. We talk about it in an intellectual and abstract fashion. I think the fact that Tony Abbott refers to it as, as not a bread and butter issue is absolutely lacking in compassion. There are people who are hanging on this debate in real fear and agony. I don't care what position you take, but you need to know that for them, this is not an issue you can dismiss with it's not a bread and butter issue. That just lacks any kind of humanity. Um, and I'm, in fact, sick of this issue being talked about in this way. This is something that is going to come up. If we don't resolve it now, it's going to keep coming back. We have an ageing population. We have a lot of baby boomers who are used to being in control of their lives. They're not going to give up that control at their end of life stage. I personally am a supporter of voluntary euthanasia for that reason. This is an argument we're going to have to have. We may have to have it serially. To se OK, so to set aside the issue of uh, euthanasia, Tom, why should the federal parliament have the right to overrule territory parliaments? Look, it's a very delicate issue. Uh, states' rights and territory rights have been deeply ingrained in the Constitution since 1901. Um, but uh, the issue was resolved back in 1996 and it hasn't been raised until now. What, what's the impetus for it being raised now? There's no real groundswell of support for overturning the position. Uh, this would only be raised if Bob Brown had control of the Senate uh, come July next year. But surely he has as much right to introduce a private member's bill. Oh, as sure, Kevin absolutely. Well, look, he does. And as long as it's a conscience vote, then that should be fine. Um, bear in mind, the last time this was raised in 1996, several Labor politicians uh, did join forces with Conservative politicians on, on the coalition side. Tony Burke being down. one of them, who's a current front pensioner. Yeah, although he wasn't in Parliament in 1996, but mm. uh, is but that he, his position? He was definitely involved in... Oh, of course, yeah, he helping, was. Look, I was out of yeah. the country at the time, but you're yeah. quite right, looking back at it, he was a player behind the scenes mm. for uh, helping uh, encourage Labor people to support the, um, the overturning of it. Jonathan, if it did go to Parliament, would it pass? Because back in 1996, when it passed the House of Reps, it was 88 mm. votes to 35. It's hard to say, but, I mean, it will be complex and it will be an issue of conscience and it will be fiercely discussed. But it's one of those things that we shouldn't shy from that discussion. I mean, we have this, uh, this, this idea at the moment, this sort of habit of sweeping a lot of these issues under the carpet, of using, I think, the, the Coles, Woolworths duopoly of Australian politics to suppress, in a lot of ways, discussion on some issues which are intractable, which are difficult and which are divisive. And we shouldn't show, you know, we, we have mechanisms, or we should have, to, to deal with that sort of complexity of discussion. And yes, it, it may go either way, but we should have the, you know, we should have the talk. OK, so, Tom, the issue itself, euthanasia, you're against it? Well, I, no, I, I readily concede Jane's point. It's a very emotional issue. It's a highly charged one for both sides of the divide. Uh, I, I've never met anyone who's been on this predicament and I think that for a lot of people who take these positions, uh, who take strong views, have known people who've mm. been on these positions. So it's, it's hard for me to really judge it. I do think strongly that it should be a conscience vote. I just don't think it's a bread and butter issue. I, I'm sorry, I just don't think it's, it's, the, it's the national priority right now in Parliament. As for the issue of assisted suicide, well, why deny it to the terminally ill? I mean, these are the slippery slope questions mm. that are often raised in these issues. Jane, that is an issue that comes up when we have that debate, isn't it? Yes, um, well, I think you can 
um, restricted to the terminally ill. I think that in the end, people will take it into their own hands. I always think uh, in hospitals previously, uh, you had to be injected with morphine by a doctor and people asked for it a lot because uh, they were frightened they might not get it in time. Now you can self um, uh, dose and people use it less because it's in their control mm. and the problem with taking this option off out of control of people who are going to get to a point in their illness where they actually can't make that decision is that we may force them to do it earlier than they would otherwise do, may in fact force them to do it when they might not actually get to that point. It just seems to me that it is individual people's right to decide what they are going to do when they come to that point in their life and that it is unconscionable for anyone else to stand there and say, look, I know you're suffering, but it's for your own good. Uh -uh. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just don't... I, don't, I, can't, I can't stomach that idea. There have been cases where people have, have been quite ill and, and very depressed and wanted to end their lives and then battled through that moment and, and got through the other side and said, gee, I'm glad I'm nothing, still around. Nothing wrong with helping and encouraging people to do that, but if someone makes a decision, then they must be allowed as an adult, fully functioning, sane person to make that kind of decision. It's not OK to say that because a few people change their minds, the ones that never would have have to suffer, you know, drown in their own bodily fluids with motor neurone disease, uh, vomit up their own faeces in some illnesses. Sorry, if I ever get to that kind of diagnosis, I'm go I know what kind of decision I'm going to be making. It's, it's a mature culture, I think, that could confront those issues of, of death and, and of supreme, extraordinary discomfort, you know. You know, sensible and coherent way. It would be a real mark of our sort of coming of age in yes. a way to and be able have to grapple with. It. And when we have these debates in the parliament, you hear politicians speaking from the heart, don't yes. you? Yes. And you think, yes. and I think really. in a debate like this, you you need to be informed of international case studies. Now, I don't know enough about other countries, but Holland has uh, legally. Uh, had legalised uh, euthanasia now for 15, 20 years or so, and there have been some horrible stories of hundreds of people each year who have actually been medically killed by their doctors and they never gave the absolute commitment that they wanted to go through that well, process. We should learn from that experience. Yes, then we need That's... to put in uh, oh, a situation sure. where it can't th happen. This is a slippery slope that you're getting into, but these are the things up for discussion, presumably in Parliament, if it does get raised. OK, well, Julia Gillard said promises made by Labor during the election may no longer apply <laughs> because of the new environment created by the hung Parliament. In an interview with the Fairfax Papers on the weekend, the Prime Minister said this logic applies to big picture reforms and anything associated with climate change is obviously one we're in in this new environment. Tom, is this a dangerous uh, area for Julia Gillard, do you think? Well, in, in, in Canberra, the annals of hypocrisy are pretty rich, but I think it's hard to beat this. This is pretty rich. I mean, here you've had uh, Julia Gillard and Wayne Swan and various other ministers during the course of the last election campaign specifically rule out a price on carbon. And now they've moved the goalpost because the balance of power in the Senate will be in their favour to enact that very kind of radical legislation uh, come July next year. Now, let's put, put this... Is, is it that radical? I mean, um, well, it is. Marius Clark it would, has come it, out and say that he's in favour of it. It would change our way of life dramatically, and especially if we do so before any kind of international consensus is reached, it would be radical because it would lead to higher energy prices, a lot of lost jobs to countries that won't make any effort to uh, conform to any kind of post-Kyoto deal. Uh, lost jobs... Um, and uh, lower growth. I mean, no, no, I think it is radical. But the point is that this uh, Labor Prime Minister has no democratic mandate, there's no legitimacy, there's no domestic consensus on the issue. There's a good reason why the Labor hardheads encouraged her and, and Kevin Rudd to shelve the ETS, and that is it's unpopular with middle Australia. The focus group surveys made it all pretty clear. Jane, People if, don't want to pay higher energy prices. Jane, if Julia Gillard does bring in a carbon tax after saying in the lead-up to the election that there was no way that that was going to happen, is this going to be on a loop? Uh, well, next I election mean, time in, in, in political advertising. Wasn't she an idiot to say that? I mean, I, it's interesting to hear Tom say that, but what we see is when the Labor Party walked away from an ETS, when they said, oh, the greatest moral challenge of our times... <laughs> Sorry, we, we made a mistake. We're just going to scrap bad. that. It's a little <laughs> bit hard. Um, that, that's when their popularity began to absolutely um, tank. So... Uh, Look, lots of people say lots of things in focus groups. Lots of people say lots of things in research. If there's one thing 30 years in advertising has taught me, don't believe research. Um, and I think that people want someone to take leadership on this issue. They do want to see something happening. There are scary stories happening all the time that make people's blood run cold. It certainly makes mine run cold. I don't think we can sit on our hands for that much longer. Yes, she was an idiot to make that kind of blanket uh, statement before the election. And yes.